Uh, in introducing Alvin Plantinga, it's hard to know where even to begin. To list off the achievements and accomplishments to, is to put him in a, would be almost to put him in a category that would, that would not communicate the, the degree of his academic excellence. He has held the, some of the most prestigious fellowships in academia, the Guggenheim, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and several from the National Endowments uh, for the Humanities. He's delivered some of the most prestigious le named lectures in the world, the, the Gifford Lectures, specifically in, in uh, philosophy of religion and philosophical theology, and also the Wilde Lectures at Oxford. In, he's held the um, presidencies of both the Central Division of the American Philosophical Association and the Society of Christian Philosophers. And you'll note that his achievements are in both uh, the realm of uh, religious philosophy and also what we might call uh, straight up philosophy. Um, philosophy that is not itself um, specifically aimed uh, at addressing Christian concerns. His, his reputation, in other words, has been made not just for being uh, uh, an excellent Christian philosopher, but simply for being an excellent philosopher, which should be the um, goal of any Christian philosopher. Uh, in, ter in terms of his publications, which is one of the standard markers of academic success, he has at current uh, over 14 uh, books to his credit, uh, and the list of articles uh, takes several swipes to scroll through on the iPad. This one ends at 136 articles, and I know for a fact, based on these titles, that this is several years old. So I assume it's now closing in on 150 articles in the best, most cited, and most prestigious uh, journals, academic journals in, in philosophy and religion. And there are 16 books in the category of on or about, in whole or part, his own work and ideas. This all sounds very impressive, and impressive it is. However, it does not begin to express the way in which Dr. Plantinga's efforts in philosophy and philosophy religion in particular have changed the shape of philosophy and specifically what it is like to be a Christian in philosophy. When he started graduate school in the mid-50s at the University of Michigan before he went on to do his PhD at Yale, being a Christian was not okay. And the stories of what it was like to be a Christian at that time the way that Christian philosophy was seen, uh, deemed a, something like a contradiction almost at that point, um, uh, is a, it's a very much a different tale that I faced as a graduate student in the 2000s. The world that I faced was a world where being a Christian in philosophy was something that you did not have to apologize for. And that, the, I, and that doing philosophy of religion, talking about God philosophically, was not something that, it could, that, that was seen as paradoxical or uh, nonsensical. It was something that was considered a legitimate philosophical area of inquiry. In addition to which, this confidence in Christians getting into philosophy has led to a situation where there are Christians at uh, m many of the most prestigious academic institutions and philosophy departments in the country. What it was like for me to be a, ph a, a Christian philosopher when I came up through grad school and went on the market was different because of the efforts that this man made uh, as a, as a, 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 in his early career forging a path that people like me were later privileged to walk. And so it is with uh, gratitude, personal gratitude, uh, that I introduce and give to you, Dr. Alvin Flanagan. Uh, thanks very much, Trent. Uh, when um, with an introduction like that, I'm reminded of uh, something I once heard the theologian Carl Henry say. He was introduced in a way that he thought was somewhat over the top. And, um, and he said, when he, he said, well, when, that, when this happens, I, I ask the Lord to forgive the introducer for stretching the truth and to forgive me for enjoying it so much. So. <laughs> 
Now, I know that you're not all uh, philosophy majors, at least I've been told that. I mean, that's a sad situation, but, you know, there, there are these disappointments in life now and then, and that's one of them. But I can see why in a way, though, because philosophy, uh, it's got kind of a downside to it. There are some sort of miserable scenarios and things you have to think about if you want to be a philosopher. So, for example, if you want to study epistemology, the theory of knowledge, you have to think about uh, being a brain in a vat. So you imagine yourself uh, captured by Alpha Centurion super scientists who take you back to their home base somewhere around Alpha Centauri. They remove your brain from your skull and put it and keep it artificially alive in a vat of nutrients. And they attach uh, leads to various parts of your brain and the other ends to their Apple computers. And then they. <laughs> Then they type into it what it is they want you to think and feel and perceive and believe and the like of that. And if that happened, then things would seem just like they do in fact seem, right? So how do you know that isn't true? Well, that's a kind of a miserable thing to think about. I mean, I, if I were you, I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time thinking about it. And another similar thing is uh, solipsism. You're a solipsist if you think you are the only thing that exists, everything else being a figment of your imagination. Um, you'd think that would be an unpopular view, but there have been some solipsists. For example, Bertrand Russell was a solipsist for part of his career. Of course, for most anything you pick out, Bertrand Russell was that for a part of his career. So. <laughs> but he was a solipsist, and um, he wrote a book in which he advocated solipsism. And a woman named, I think her name was Lady Ladd Franklin, wrote him and said she was really convinced by what he said. And, uh, she thought that he had some really good arguments, and she wondered, she said, finally, why aren't there more of us solipsists? <laughs> <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was a young philosopher, which by now is a long time ago, um, at Wayne State University, I heard that there was a solipsist in the medical school, a real genuine live solipsist. And I wanted to see what a solipsist looked like and you know, how a solipsist would behave. So I went over to see this, uh, this man. He was a university professor, which in those days at that place meant he could teach any course in the whole university that he wanted to. So if he wanted to teach my course in logic, for example, he'd just come over to the philosophy department and say, planning, I'm gonna be teaching logic this year, you'll have to teach something else, surgery maybe, something like that. <laughs> anyway, I went to see this guy and we had a conversation. He was really quite cordial given that I was just a figment. I mean, he, <laughs> I don't know if he treated all figments that well, but I, I, was, I thought this was, uh, was going pretty well. But we didn't have a lot to say to each other. So uh, finally, um, I left. And as I left, one of his younger colleagues took me, apart, took me aside and said, you know, we take very good care of Dr. So-and-so, because when he goes, we all go. So. <laughs> but I, um, my talk has nothing whatever to do with solipsism, so uh, you can forget the whole subject as far as I'm concerned. I want to talk about science and religion in instead, and I hope everybody has a copy of the handout, or at least access to a copy. Um, the title is Science and Religion, Where the Conflict Really Lies. That's the title of this paper. I have a book that recently came out called Where the Conflict Really Lies, Science and Religion. So you can take it, take it either way, whichever way you like. Um, there are several areas where people think that there is conflict between science and religion. You might call them flashpoints, something like that. For example, the idea that um, God acts specially in the world, um, does miracles. For example, that would be an example of special divine action, action beyond creation and conservation. It's often said that God's doing this would be incompatible with uh, the laws that science promulgates. So there's a kind of science religion conflict there. Um, there is a conflict between various theories in evolutionary psychology, which has become perhaps the most dominant kind of psychology, at least so I understand, become orthodoxy in psychology. Um, there is uh, certain kinds of scientific scripture scholarship, which also seem 
often seems to come up with conclusions <laughs> quite incompatible with, uh, with Christian belief, let's say. So there are these various areas. One particular area is that of evolution, where many people claim there is conflict. People both from the left, for example, Dawkins and Bennett and, and uh, the, um, the dreaded new atheists on the one hand, and on the other hand, people, uh, people uh, who are committed to a certain versions of Christianity find that, there's, find that there's conflict there. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this particular area. I want to talk about evolution and possible conflict with theistic belief. That's for the first part of my talk. And in the second part, I want to do something quite different. I want to argue that there, while there isn't conflict between science and, um, and what we could call mere theism, or um, C.S. Lewis's version of mere Christianity, there's no conflict between science and, say, mere Christianity. There is conflict between naturalism, which I take to be the idea that there's no such person as God or anything like God, naturalism on the one hand and science on the other hand. That's what I want to argue. So if you take a look at the sheet, the first bit there, so I'll argue that uh, one contemporary evolutionary theory is not incompatible with theistic belief, and I want to also say it's not incompatible with uh, Christian belief. Theistic belief would be belief in God. That would, and this would be shared by Christians and Jews and Muslims. Um, but Christ, Christian belief is more specific, goes beyond mere theistic belief. And uh, also that the main anti-theistic arguments involving evolution together with other premises also fail. So one, one view might be that evolutionary theory, just as it stands, is incompatible with, say, uh, Christianity. Another view might be that it's not incompatible with it just as it stands, but if you add a couple of very obvious premises, then, um, Christi then the resulting um, set of propositions is inconsistent. So that Christian, so that evolutionary theory plus some obvious additional premises would be uh, incompatible with Christian belief. And then third, I want to argue this: um, naturalism, as I say, there is the thought that there is no such thing, no such person as the god of theistic religion or anything like God. So naturalism is stronger than atheism. Atheism says there's no such person as God. Naturalism says also there's nothing like God. You could be um, an atheist without ascending to the full heights of being a naturalist, or maybe it's descend descending to the full depths of being a naturalist. Um, but if you are a naturalist, you have to be an atheist, okay? I want to say, um, Naturalism is an essential element in the naturalistic worldview, which is itself a sort of quasi or semi-religion in the sense that it plays some of the most important roles of religion. So just as religion gives us answers to great human questions like, uh, is there such a person as God? And uh, how should people live? What is in the long run the best, best life for a human being? What's the summum bonum, as people sometimes say for, for people? Uh, naturalism and, and religions both give answers to that, those questions, and so you could think of naturalism as a sort of uh, quasi-religion, semi-religion. I want to say that, uh, that naturalism is, in fact, incompatible with evolution, and if it's incompatible with evolution, then it's incompatible with science. So there is a science religion, or a science quasi-religion, conflict, all right, but it's a conflict between naturalism and science, and not a conflict between Christianity or theism and science. Okay? That's the program. So first then, uh, the first section there of the sheet, um, I say evolution, that term, covers a multitude of theses. The New Testament tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. Evolution covers a multitude not of sins, but of theses, the term does. First, the ancient earth thesis, according to which the earth is uh, very old, vastly older than people used to think, say, 200 years ago, uh, maybe as much as 4 billion years old, certainly not, say, 6,000 or 10,000 years old. 
And second, the thesis of descent with modification, which is the idea that all of the vast variety that the living world, both animal and plant, um, all this enormous variety, and it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I, there are thousands of species of beetles alone, I think. Maybe there are some beetleologists here who can confirm or deny what I say. But um, whether or not exactly how many species of beetles there are, there are lots of different kinds of creatures, all right? Uh, that, that all of this has come to be by a process of descent with modification. That is, a process whereby the, whereby the offspring, whereby offspring differ usually in relatively minor ways from their parents. And by virtue of these differences accumulating in various ways, you wind up with all the enormous diversity that uh, our world actually displays, living, the living world. And next, the, uh, pro the uh, common ancestry thesis which is the thought that if you pick any two living things and trace back their ancestry far enough, you run across a common ancestor, right? So that uh, you and the poison ivy in your backyard are in fact cousins. <laughs> Distant cousins, no doubt, but cousins. And this is easier to, to imagine in the case of some people than others, but, <laughs> but, uh, but there it is, all right? And then, um, and then, Finally, four, something I'll call Darwinism. If you don't like that term, you can use whatever term you like, but Darwin made a claim like this. This is the claim that the principal mechanism driving this whole process of descent with modification is natural selection winnowing random genetic mutation. So you all know what this amounts to. The idea is that uh, genetic mutations arise, ran they're said to be random, arise randomly. Uh, some of these, most of these are neutral. Um, many of them are deleterious and are lethal and the uh, beings to which they accrue die. A few though, some though, are actually adaptive and enable the creature in question to uh, do better in the battle for survival, survival and reproduction than, uh, than its peers. And if, if, these, if this mutation is also heritable, then descendants of this creature will have it and because it's adaptive, it will tend to spread through the whole population and eventually uh, be just part of that species, part of that genotype, um, and then the whole process can start over again. And by virtue of this happening over and over again, and of course happening at the same, many of them such things happening at the same time, by virtue of this, you get the enormous uh, variety that our world displays, all right? Well, now the question is, um, is evolution so thought of are you coming as a substitute? Or? Yeah, I'm a substitute. Okay, right. All right, okay. I don't know if this is the second string or the first string. But. <laughs> so, so the question is whether evolution thought of as involving these four theses is incompatible with uh, theistic religion. And I'm thinking of uh, C.S. Lewis's when, uh, theistic religion and Christianity, and I'm thinking of, the of Christianity as uh, C.S. Lewis's, as I say, mere Christianity, which we could think of as something like the intersection, what's in common, of the great Christian creeds, the uh, Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, um, Catholic Baltimore Catechism, the uh, Heidelberg Catechism, the, uh, the Belgic Confession, um, various Presbyterian and Lutheran catechisms and the like, all right? So sort of what's in common to them uh, it's a rough intersection of these, of these great creeds. That's what I'm thinking of as mere Christianity. And I'm asking whether Darwinism is incompatible with uh, mere Christianity, Christianity so thought of. And um, many people say so. Well, if you look at these theses, the ancient earth thesis doesn't seem to be incompatible with Christianity so thought of. The creeds don't say that the earth is 6,000 years old or something like that. Um, the thesis of descent with modification that life came to be in that fashion, uh, that seems compatible with, with mere Christianity. Same for the common ancestry thesis, God could have created the world in that fashion. Um, if there is one here where, there's, where there is more, uh, sort of more immediate uh, uh, possibility for conflict, it might be with Darwinism the claim that the principal mechanism driving this whole process is natural selection working on random genetic mutation. 
So we can ask the question, is Darwinism incompatible with uh, mere Christianity? On the face of it, it looks to me as if the answer would be no, it's not incompatible with it. It might or might not be how God did things, but God could have done things that way, could have created things that way if he'd wanted to. He could, for example, have brought about the right mutations, the appropriate mutations, caused them to occur at the right time. He, uh, he could have preserved various uh, populations from destruction by way of storms or uh, tornadoes or uh, tidal waves or earthquakes and the like. It looks as if he could have done this and by sort of um, guiding the whole process, come up with what it is he uh, that what it is he wanted there to be, what kinds of living creatures he wanted. He could have, as I say in the sheet here, could have caused the right mutations to arise at the right time. Uh, where people, where there, there is a conflict, really, comes up in connection with the idea that God has created human beings in his image. And it's really just a special case of a broader conflict. But if God has created human beings in his image, then he intended that, and if he did this by virtue of a process of evolution, he intended that that process turn out a certain way. He aimed, he wanted things to turn out a certain way and took action to see that they did turn out that way. So if um, it's by virtue of natural selection working on random genetic mutation that all the variety of the living world has come to be, then God oversaw that process or uh, supervised it or, um, or, um, or guided it. Um, that would be, that would follow, I mean, it, it would, it's, uh, it's a consequence of God's creating human beings in his image, his wanting things to turn out a certain way. It's a consequence of that together with the thought that human beings would come to be by way of a, Darwin, a Darwinian process, that the Darwinian process in question is guided, orchestrated, overseen by God. Now, uh, what's not consistent with Christian belief is the claim that evolution and Darwinism are unguided, where I'll take that to include being unplanned and unintended. And uh, it's exactly that. I mean, there's a whole choir of distinguished experts that tell us that, as a matter of fact, evolution is, in fact, unguided. The whole process is unguided. Here are some on the sheet here. George Gaylord Simpson, he says, man, and I add in brackets, no doubt woman as well, is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. I suppose he means to include women. I mean, it would be a peculiar view, I suppose, to think that man is the <laughs> result of a purposeless process that didn't have it in mind, but not so for women. I mean, they, they were planned all along or something like that. So um, that's what he says. Stephen Jay Gould says, if the evolutionary tape were to be re rewound and then let go forward again, the chances are we'd get creatures of a very different sort, not, nothing much like what we do have. Pro he says in one place that maybe just bacteria. I mean, bacteria are exceedingly successful in the uh, evolutionary derby. And maybe if the whole thing, if the tape were rewound, of course you can't rewind the tape. I mean, strictly speaking, that doesn't make sense, but you can still see what he has in mind. If the tape were to be rewound and let go forward again, maybe just wind up with all bacteria. Or uh, who knows what you'd wind up with. In any event, un it's unlikely that you would wind up with creatures in God's image. And here's what Richard Dawkins, one of these, um, the new atheists, the dreaded four horsemen of atheism, as they're called, you all aware of the four horsemen of atheism? Uh, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Bennett and uh, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, these four horsemen who uh, make it, who are aiming to trample religion into the dust. Um, one of them is, is Richard Dawkins, and here's a quotation from The Blind Watchmaker. It's more, his more recent book, um, uh, the, the God Delusion. The Blind Watchmaker, in my opinion, is a very good book. It's, in my opinion, completely mistaken, but still a very good book. Whereas the, uh, this other book, The God Delusion, is completely mistaken and not a very good book. It's a terrible book. It's much more like uh, an ignorant screed than a real contribution to a discussion of this topic. But in any event, in a better book, The Blind Watchmaker, Dawkins says this, 
All appearances to the contrary, the only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics, albeit deployed in a very special way. A true watchmaker has foresight. He designs his cogs and springs and plans their interconnections with a future purpose in his mind's eye. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation, um, um, discourses of this general kind which tell us, you know, uh, we've been mistaken in the past, we thought there was such a person as God or whatever, now we know better. You, you find this, this phrase, as we now know, in the Malat. So you might call this, as we now knowism. All right? He says, uh, which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, natural selection, has no purpose in mind. It has no mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight at all. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it's the blind watchmaker, the title of his book. And the subtitle of the book is, uh, is this, Why the Evidence of Evolution Reveals a Universe Without Design. Why the Evidence of Evolution. So, I mean, this is a big important part of the book. A uh, big important part of the whole project is to show how the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design. A universe and an evolutionary process not orchestrated or guided or overseen by God or anyone else. Well, we can ask this question, why, did, why does Dawkins think natural selection is blind and unguided? What is this uh, evidence from evolution for a universe without design? Why does he think that the evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design? Why does he think that? Well, in this book, um, Dawkins does three things. The first thing he does is to recount some of the fascinating, uh, fascinating anatomical details, um, details of the way various creatures are constructed and how they live, which, um, which, which he does really well. And some of these things, some of his descriptions are, are extremely interesting. He's, a, he's an excellent writer when it comes to, he's, he's an enthusiastic and perceptive, uh, colorful writer when it comes to describing some of the features of, uh, interesting features of current life on our planet. Uh, I remember, for example, he talks about bats and how bats can proceed through a completely dark cave at a very high rate of speed. And uh, a, bat, a cave full of stalactites that hang front down from the ceiling and stalagmites that come up from the floor, or maybe it's the other way around, but just those stalags, whatever. So they can, they can fly through this, you know, these little passages without so much as brushing against one at, at a very high rate of speed in a completely dark cave because they've got this kind of sonar, sonar you know, that they send out uh, sound signals which bounce off obstructions and in this way they can uh, navigate through, through, uh, through such, a kind of, uh, <coughs> such kind of maze, all right? And when he does that sort of thing, he's, he's very good and very interesting. Second, he tries to refute arguments for the conclusion that blind, unguided evolution could not have produced certain of the wonders of the living world. So going all the way back to Darwin's time, there were people, for example, St. George Mavart, who argued that various features, he talked about the eye, but others talked about other things, uh, various features just could not have come to be by unguided um, Darwinian processes in the time that there has been available is just too, too complicated, too, uh, too, too, much, uh, too much design, too much interconnection. If you think about the eye, well, I won't go into that, but, if you, but uh, we could if you want to, but it's, it's hard to see how some of these things could have come to be because various different improvements would all have to be made, you might say, at the same time. So he tries to refute those arguments. And the third thing he does is he makes suggestions as to how these uh, particular features that um, the people have cited as being such that unguided Darwinism couldn't produce them, he makes suggestions as to how these and other organic systems could have developed by unguided evolution. That's what he does. The main form of his argument, though, for the main conclusion of the book, or the alleged main conclusion, namely that the uh, evidence of evolution reveals a universe without design, 
seems to go like this. The first premise, we know of no irrefutable objections to its being biologically possible that all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes. All right? Another way to put that would be, no one has proved that it's impossible that all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes, all right? That's the premise of the argument. And the conclusion is, all of life has come to be by way of unguided Darwinian processes, all right? Now, um, philosophers sometimes give uncogent arguments, and I have to shamefacedly confess I've given some myself. <laughs> but philosophers, and hardly anybody, comes up with arguments where the distance between premise and conclusion is astonishingly great as it is in this case. The premise is, nobody's proved it impossible at P, the conclusion is therefore P, right? So I come home, for example, and tell my wife, uh, President Obama has just decided to strike a medal for philosophy. It's gonna be a new medal struck for philosophy, and I'm gonna be the first recipient. Well, she says, oh, really? What makes you think that? And I say, no one has proved it impossible. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not gonna fly very far, right? I mean, um, I don't know exactly what would happen if I did that, but I'd rather not think about it. So, I mean, to say, to, to propose, to show, to argue that it's not been proved to be impossible that P is not sufficient for a proof of P, not by a long shot, right? If it were, you could run in all kinds of, but nobody's proved it impossible that there be an odd number of stars, uh, so there are an odd number. Nobody's proved it impossible that there be an even number of stars, I mean total number, so the total number is even. Therefore, the total number's got to be both odd and even. I mean, this way of argument, arguing is not going to fly at all. So Dawkins utterly fails to show that the facts of evolution reveal a universe without design. Still, the fact that he and other experts assert this subtitle of his loudly and slowly, as it were, can be expected to convince a lot of people that the biological theory of evolution is, in fact, incompatible with, uh, theistic, with the theistic Christian and other theistic belief that the universe of the living world has been designed. Well, you might say, what about the fact that the relevant genetic mutations are said to be random? Uh, could it be that these are both random, these mutations both random and also caused by God? Well, here the thing to see is that the term random has a variety of uses, um, and it's got a kind of special use, for example, in mathematics when you speak of um, a random series, let's say, but also as a special use in biology. And here's what Ernst Meyer, who was um, the dean of 20th century evolutionary, uh, evolutionary biology, what he says it means. When it's said that a mutation or variation is random, the statement simply means that there is no correlation between the production of new genotypes and the adaptational needs of an organism in a given environment. So there's no uh, correlation between what would be good for this organism and, which, and which, um, uh, random, which genetic mutations arise. And Eliot Sober puts it like this. Eliot Sober is perhaps the most distinguished philosopher of, of uh, biology at present. He says there's no physical mechanism, either inside the organism or outside, that detects which mutations would be beneficial and causes those mutations to occur. To say that these mutations are random is to say there's no physical mechanism either inside the organism or outside the organism which can detect which mutations would be good for this creature and then causes those mutations to occur. And it's perfectly obvious really that uh, a, a mutation could be both random in that sense and also caused by God or produced by God, all right? So I would say the claim that um, evolution um, demonstrates that human beings and other living creatures have not contrary to appearances been designed, I don't think that's a part of or a consequence of the scientific theory of evolution as it stands at all. It's what you might call a metaphysical or theological add-on. Lots of people who, um, lots of people who, who are intent in arguing that there isn't any such person as God, um, co-opt evolution, the scientific theory, 
And uh, they talk as if the theory itself implies that there's no such person as God, that is, that there's many, that evolution is unguided. But I'm inclined to think it's a metaphysical or theological add-on. That's what I say. Uh, but this is not totally obvious. It's not totally trivial to tell what a scientific theory, what uh, the theory does say exactly, right? There's no, um, there is no axiomatic formulation of the theory um, inscribed on the walls of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, for example. Different people seem to say different things about it. The judge, at, uh, Judge Jones at the Dover trial seemed to say, well, the theory of evolution does include being something like being unguided and so on. And uh, there does seem to be confusion here. So for example, Cardinal Schoenbrunn and Pope John Paul maybe aren't exactly on the same page. Uh, John Paul said, this, that he seemed favorably disposed towards evolution, saying that it was more than a theory. Cardinal Schoenborn said, evolution in the sense of common ancestry might be true, but evolution in the neo-Darwinian sense, an unguided, unplanned process of random variation and natural selection is not. He seems to suggest that part of the scientific theory itself is that it, this process is unguided and unplanned. And as most polls review, uh, reveal, most, uh, as polls review, most Americans have grave doubts about the truth of evolution. Many Christians are um, concerned about the teaching of evolution in public schools, and they want to add something as a corrective, maybe intelligent design, or they want evolution taught as a mere theory, or in the context of a critical discussion. Um, they don't want it taught as the sober truth. They want objections to it taught. And why do they think that? Well, why do they feel that way? One reason is just that we're regularly told by the experts, Dawkins and Dennett, Ayala, Gould, and others, that current scientific evolutionary theory asserts or implies that the living world is not designed, all right? And that the evolutionary process is unguided. The National Association of Biology Teachers, until 10 years ago or so, officially described evolution on their website as an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process, unsupervised, impersonal. And if we're regularly told by the experts that in fact the theory is a theory of unguided evolution, it's no wonder that many Christians believe that. And if they do believe it, it's no wonder that they don't want it to be taught as a sober truth in the public schools that they themselves support. Thus understood, it's incompatible with Christian and Jewish and Muslim belief. Clearly there are questions of justice here, which I won't go into now, but uh, I'll just point to them. I'm gonna skip the next bit here, part two, broader anti-theistic arguments from evolution, and go to part three, naturalism versus evolution. Every 20 minutes. <laughs> here comes the first string, or back in again, or? <laughs> I mean, if you think you can only translate what I say for 20 minutes, how about me? I've got to say it, but well, I don't get any relief here. So part three, naturalism versus evolution. I want to use, just to make things easier uh, uh, and more compact, I want to use the letter N to mean naturalism the idea that there's no such person as God or anything like God. And I want to use the letter E to refer to the idea that the living world, including in particular us human beings, have come to be by virtue of the processes described in current evolutionary theory, all right? And I want to use the letter R for the proposition that our cognitive faculties are reliable. Now let me unpack that a bit. When I speak of cognitive faculties, I'm thinking of those faculties or processes that produce beliefs in us. So for example, by virtue of memory, I believe, I know that, uh, I don't know, that this morning I was in my hotel room. And by virtue of memory, I remember that, uh, say, the day before yesterday, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Memory perception, by virtue of perception, you know things, hold beliefs about your immediate environment, that there might, for example, a lot of people here uh, that there's a lectern here and a bottle here and so on. By virtue of perception, that's another one of our cognitive faculties then, perception. 
memory and perception would be a couple of our cognitive faculties. Another one would be what you could, could call uh, logical or mathematical insight. Or if you want to be more fancy, you could call it a priori insight, all right? Um, whereby, you know, simple truths of arithmetic, that two plus one equals three, for example. Simple truths of logic, that if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then he's mortal and Socrates is mortal. So by virtue of um, a priori insight or logical intuition, you know these simple truths of arithmetic and in fact, then by virtue of the same process can deduce other truths from the simple ones and wind up with pretty complicated ones. All right, and the same goes for logic. That's another kind then, another kind of uh, cognitive faculty. Still another might be um, uh, what Thomas Reed calls sympathy, whereby you can take a look at somebody often and tell what they're thinking or feeling. Uh, I can take a look at my wife quite often and tell that she's annoyed by some little stupidity on my part, or maybe big stupidity on my part. Um, so that's still another kind of faculty. It's not by way of an argument, rather, but rather you just take a look at somebody often and tell what they're thinking and feeling. Maybe there are still other cognitive faculties, maybe a moral sense, whereby you know that certain kinds of behavior are uh, just dead wrong, hurting people just for the fun of it, and other kinds are right and ought to be pursued. Um, Calvin thinks there's a sensus divinitatis, a sense of God's presence, so that uh, under certain conditions you just find yourself with beliefs about God. There's this whole range of faculties, cognitive faculties we human beings have. And now uh, we, we assume sort of automatically without even thinking about it that these faculties are reliable, that they produce, at least when used um, over the sort of middle range of their application, that they produce mainly true beliefs, right? True, if I were to uh, take a look at a, what looked at, at a white patch a long ways away in the mountains, I could say 600 yards, uh, I might think it's a mountain goat. I might form the belief that it's a mountain goat. And then if I, when I get closer, I see it's not. It's just a patch of snow or something like that. So at the limits of their ap applicability, they aren't all that reliable, maybe. Same way for what goes on in advanced physics. And that's partly why advanced physics keeps changing its mind about what things are like. Um, but over the, over the sort of large intermediate range of their application, uh, they, we take it utterly for granted that they are, in fact, reliable, all right? Uh, well, the, what I want to argue here is the following. First of all, I want to argue that, number one there, the probability that our faculties are reliable Given naturalism and evolution, given N and E, that probability is low. So I'm talking about conditional probability, the probability of one thing given something else, probability of one proposition um, given the truth of some other one. So for example, I might ask, uh, what's the probability that Mr. A will live to be 70, given that Mr. A is now 35, um, seriously overweight, never gets any exercise, eats nothing but junk food, sits around and watches television all day, and has grandparents, all of whom died before they were 60. Kind of a low probability that he will, that Mr. A will live to be 70, given those things. You might contrast that with the probability that Mr. B will live to be 70, given that Mr. B is now 65, runs 10 miles every morning, watches his diet like a hawk, and has uh, grandparents, all of whom live to be 100, that probability would be a lot higher, right? So the probability of one thing given something else. What's the probability that uh, Jock is a Mormon, given that Jock lives in Glasgow, uh, <coughs> Scotland? Well, probably fairly low. What's the probability that, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, what's the probability that Brigham is a Mormon, given that Brigham lives in Salt Lake City? A much higher probability, right? So you get the idea, the probability of one thing on another, on the condition of the truth of something else. And the first premise of my argument is that the probability of our faculties being reliable, given naturalism and evolution, is low, all right? And I'm gonna argue for that just below. The second premise is that one who accepts naturalism and evolution, and also sees that one is true, has an undefeated defeater 
for R, where a defeater for a belief you've got is some other belief you acquire such that as long as you hold that other belief that you've acquired, you can't sensibly anymore hold the first belief, all right? Can't rationally or sensibly, justifiably hold the first belief. Here's a classical example uh, dating back to the philosopher Roderick Chisholm. Uh, you look into a field or meadow and you see what you take to be a sheep. Form the belief naturally enough, there's a sheep in this meadow. But then along comes the owner of the field, whom you know to be an honest person, and he tells you that he doesn't have any sheep, doesn't keep any sheep in that field, but he does have a, a sheep dog that from this distance looks like a sheep. Well, then you've got a defeater for your belief that there's a sheep there, right? Um, maybe I read the guidebook to Aberdeen in Scotland, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, and it says that uh, the university was founded in 1595. So I formed the belief that it was founded in 1595. What else? Uh, but then I go to a cocktail party, and I see this guy who looks really kind of sheepish and downtrodden, his head's down and so on. And, um, and, I, it, and I talk to him, and, and he, he says, you know, I just discovered I made this horrifying mistake in the guidebook I wrote. Uh, the university wasn't founded in 1595, it was 1495. Well, then I've got a defeater for my belief that it was formed in 1595. So you get the idea what a defeater is. It's an, a new belief you acquire, a defeater for a given belief, P, is a new belief you acquire such that as long as you hold this new belief, you cannot any longer rationally or sensibly hold P, believe P, all right? Now, defeaters can, of course, be themselves defeated. So you can have defeater defeaters. In fact, you can have defeater, defeater, defeaters, and defeater, 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 defeaters, and so on. I mean, it gets sort of totally uninteresting after about two uh, repetitions, but in any event, you can have defeater, defeaters, and I won't say how, just how that goes. I think you can see how that would go, but uh, the premise, too, there says if you accept naturalism and evolution, and you also see that one is true, then you have an undefeated defeater for the proposition that your cognitive faculties or our cognitive faculties are reliable, all right? Well, one who has a defeater for R, for the belief that your faculties are reliable, has a defeater for any belief she takes to be produced by her cognitive faculties, right? Including in an E itself. So if, if you <coughs> believe in an E, and uh, you see that one is true, then you get a defeater for R, and if you have a defeater for R, you have a defeater for any belief you take to be produced by your cognitive faculties, which of course is all of your beliefs, and hence you have a defeater for NNE itself. So, NNE is self-defeating. It provides an, unde a def an undefeated defeater for itself, and therefore can't rationally be accepted. Okay. Now last, what I want to do is uh, give an argument for premise one, which seems to me to be the, uh, the premise of that bunch of premises that most needs support, okay? So uh, first I want to take naturalism to include materialism. Um, maybe naturalism doesn't, strictly speaking, entail materialism, but at any rate, most naturalists, all the ones I know, are also materialists where I'm thinking of materialism as a materialism about human beings, not about everything. So you could be a materialist about human beings while you thought there were some beings that weren't just material objects, for example, God or numbers or propositions, okay? But if you're a materialist about human beings, then you think a human being just is a material object. Uh, no immaterial self or soul or ego, um, Descartes and um, Augustine both thought that a human being was, like God, an immaterial substance, self, <coughs> but unlike God, <coughs> one that's int intimately related to a particular physical object, namely its body, all right? So from that point of view, I am not material. I am an immaterial substance, but I am uh, very closely related to this particular um, material substance, namely my body which maybe doesn't uh, respond to what I want it to do as well as it did 30, 40 years ago, but still, I'm intimately connected with this body, not in the same way with this one over here. I mean, I can make my arm go up, 
but I can only make her arm go up by grabbing it and raising it, right? Well, a materialist thinks that that's not the kind of thing I am at all. What I, what I am is a material object. Maybe I'm my body, maybe I'm my brain, or whole nervous system, maybe I'm part of my brain, the left hemisphere, for example, maybe it's some part of the left hemisphere, Many different possibilities here, but in any event, just a material object. All right, so I'm taking naturalism then to include materialism, and then ask yourself, from the point of view of materialism, what kind of thing will a belief be? The belief that two plus one equals three, or that, uh, or that uh, Proust is more subtle than Louis L'Amour. Uh, I don't know if you know who, if you know who Louis L'Amour is, but Louis L'Amour uh, wrote some 250 cowboy novels. Many of them, no doubt, set quite close to Baylor here, quite close to Waco, um, and they're not outstanding for their subtlety. <laughs> On the other hand, Proust wrote this uh, gigantic thing, A Remembrance of Things Past, which um, is, I can't say that I've even read it, but I've heard it's very subtle. All right. <laughs> So I've got the belief that Proust is more subtle than Lemur. Okay, what is that belief? Well, I mean, animal, vegetable, mineral, what kind of a thing is it? And we're talking about its ontology. What kind of a thing is this, is this belief? All there is to be, uh, for it to be, as far as I can see, from the point of view of materialism, is it would have to be uh, something like uh, an event in my nervous system involving a whole bunch of neurons, right? an event somewhere in my nervous system, or a, long, or a structure, a long-standing event or structure in my nervous system that involves a whole bunch of neurons clicking away together. Uh, maybe this particular structure has inputs from other uh, such structures or from sense organs. Maybe it has outputs to, uh, to muscles and glands and so on via uh, efferent nerves. So that's the kind of thing that a belief would be, all right? Now, what we can assume about these creatures, so well, wait a minute, so next I say, instead of thinking about ourselves, think about a population of creatures on some distant planet. In order to avoid sort of automatically transferring into our argument what we normally think about ourselves, think instead about a population of creatures on some distant planet, maybe in some other universe, in some other part of the multiverse, as people talk about it nowadays, and suppose that N and E both hold for them, so naturalism holds for them, and so does evolution. What we can assume about these creatures is that their behavior is adaptive. They have survived, um, they've come to be by way of evolution, they've survived, so their behavior is adaptive, it's conducive to survival and reproduction. This behavior is caused by processes in their brains. If you ask, for example, what is it, my arm goes up, uh, what is it that causes that, well, there'll be signals sent from my brain uh, down various nerve channels and the like to the appropriate muscle, causing that muscle to contract and up goes my arm, all right? So um, these, this behavior then, this adaptive behavior is caused by processes in their brains, which we can call the underlying neurology. So we can say that that neurology is also adaptive, okay? This neurology, however, furthermore, also causes their beliefs. I mean, my believing a certain thing just is a kind of neurological structure of some sort, so the neurology in question also causes belief. But as far as that adaptive behavior is concerned, it doesn't matter whether those beliefs are true or false. If the beliefs are true, that's fine. If they're false, it's also fine. As long as the underlying neurology causes the right adaptive behavior, it doesn't matter about the truth value of the beliefs that it also causes. Could cause true beliefs, could cause false beliefs. You'll still get adaptive behavior if the underlying neurology causes the same thing. It therefore doesn't matter whether their beliefs are mostly true or mostly false. So take any particular belief. What's the probability that that belief is true? What's the probability here on the relevant uh, propositions that that belief is true? Well, it could be true or it could be false, and no more reason to think it's false than true or true than false, so you'd have to say it's about a half. But then the probability of R for these creatures is low. So if you have like 100 independent beliefs 
and the probability with respect to each one of those beliefs is uh, that it's true is a half, then the probability that three quarters of your beliefs, which would be a relatively low bar for reliability, that three quarters of your beliefs are true is going to be very low, maybe one out of a million, something like that. All right? Okay. So probability, the probability of R with respect to N and E, uh, with respect to these creatures, is very low. And the same will go for us. So, so I say, <coughs> premise one is true. So I say, um, there isn't any conflict between evolution, or science more generally, really, and mere Christianity, but there is a conflict a, a religious or quasi-religious conflict between uh, naturalism and science, between naturalism and evolution, in the sense that you can't sensibly believe both N and E. Thank you. I'm assuming you would like me to see the question, or would you like to do it yourself? I can do it myself. I you want me to announce the or do you want to do that yourself? Well, Let me just do here anyway, you might as well. So we will have a period of question and answer right now. We've got plenty of time for, for uh, plenty of questions and answers. We very much welcome questions from non-philosophy majors. Um, it's, it's, it would be great to get some questions from, from some non-philosophy majors. And if there are science majors, or graduate students or professors. That would be fantastic to have questions from them as well. Um, there will be a reception when we're done downstairs with some food, and you are invited to come to that when we're done. And uh, I'll just either call it when we get the time or when we'll put it down. Okay. okay? Right. Yeah. So, uh, questions or comments, suggestions? Yes. I'm sorry, if you could stand up and speak loudly. Yeah, the question is, uh, if I understand, I mean, it's quite a long ways away, it's a big room. Uh, why do I assume that the probability with respect to these creatures, with respect to any particular belief, is, uh, of, of its being true is no greater than of its being false? Given that, he says, uh, true beliefs would be more adaptive. True beliefs, if you, if you hold true beliefs, you're likely to be more successful as you blunder your way through life than if you hold false beliefs. And of course, I agree. I mean, I think true beliefs are much more likely to be adaptive than false beliefs, as a matter of fact. What we're asking about is how things would be, however, if materialism were true, right? So if materialism is true, then you've got um, a belief, a neurological structure, which causes a certain kind of behavior, and it also causes, uh, uh, it also has a certain content. And its content um, depends on the neurology. Well, as far as the content goes, if you've got the right neurology, if you get the right kind of, um, right kind of uh, neurological structures, the right kind of, um, we could call them neurophysiological structures, if causing the appropriate kind of behavior, you'll get adaptive action. And if that adaptive action, if the neurology that causes the adaptive action also causes a belief, um, it doesn't matter whether the content is true or false. The belief itself, the content of the belief, doesn't get to play a role in the uh, causal chain that leads, to, that leads to the behavior. So you're quite right. I mean, as a matter of fact, I would agree with you. Uh, true beliefs are more adaptive than false beliefs. But we're talking now about how things would be if materialism were true. And then uh, it seems to me that's not so. Yeah. See if I understand that. So you're saying on some theories in philosophy of mind, the same kind of uh, behavior would always be associated with the same kind of content. Yeah, maybe so. Right. 
But that's not a problem so far, right, for what I say, right? So, I mean, suppose whenever you get the same kind of behavior, suppose that's a manifestation of a certain kind of neurophysiology, and suppose that neurophysiology also causes a certain kind of belief, uh, well, then maybe it's true that when you get similar behavior, you will typically have similar beliefs. My point is, though, the beliefs don't have to be true. They can be similar, similarly false. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Um, again, that we normally or we would ordinarily think that's the way it does go, right? But again, we've got to think about how it goes from the point of view of materialism. So from that point of view, you've got this neural structure that causes uh, this belief, which is a neural structure. It's got two kinds of properties, neurophysiological properties and a content <laughs> property, and it causes a certain kind of behavior. The point is, if materialism is true, it doesn't cause that by virtue of the content that it's got, but only by virtue of the neurophysiological properties that it's got, this belief. So what causes my arm to go up like that? Uh, well, it'll be um, various signals sent down various nerve channels from my brain or other parts of my nervous system. And the same thing will go for something, for some, um, some action that's caused by one of my beliefs, maybe I believe it's a good thing to do this, let's say, but it won't matter what the content is. If the thing, if the belief in question had a different content but the same neurophysiological properties, it would cause the very same behavior. It's not by virtue of its content that this belief causes what it does, it's just by virtue of its neurophysiology. That's the thought, right. That's the thought, and furthermore, that's a true thought. <laughs> Other questions or suggestions or yes in the back. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have to get a little closer. asking how do I get a defeater, all right? I, that's, that's the question, right? Suppose I believe, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Well, suppose, I mean, all I've got to go on here is N and E, right? So I believe N and E, and I see that the probability of R given N and E is low. I don't have some independent access to R, to whether or not R, my beliefs are in fact reliable. Maybe I assume that they are, but now I see that they are, that this probability is in fact low. So the sensible thing, naturally enough, to do is no longer accept R, just as with respect to a thermometer. Suppose I've been believing this thermometer on my porch for, uh, for two years or so. Now I find out that the thermometer is entirely unreliable. Uh, well, then I've got a defeater for the belief that it's reliable. Or now I find out rather, to make it exactly parable, now I find out rather that with respect to some, uh, some obvious facts about the thermometer, it's very unreliable. I don't have evidence on the other side. The natural thing then is to no longer trust the thermometer and take it to be unreliable. And I would say the same thing goes in this case. Right. Other questions? Yes. But 
Well, they could arise. It, it could be, given naturalism, materialism, and evolution, that our beliefs are, for the most part, true. It's just that uh, the prob that pro probability would be low. It could happen. There's no proof that that can't happen. Uh, but natural selection, in modifying our behavior, uh, really doesn't get to take a look at what, uh, at what, the, beliefs, what the content of the beliefs connected with them is. I mean, Natural selection might say just has to take pot luck there. If a given kind of neurology produces a certain kind of uh, belief or produces a certain kind of content, then um, when, if natural selection modifies that, uh, uh, that neurology, it just has to take whatever content goes with a new neurology. What people generally think here is that uh, uh, belief content, mental properties generally supervene on physical properties. That is, this is what materialists think. The belief content is determined by and supervenes on the uh, neurophysiological properties. So there'll be some kind of law-like connection between certain kinds of neurology and certain kinds of belief content. And natural selection can't modify that. Natural selection just has to take pot luck in the sense that with respect to any particular kind of neurology that it causes, because that neurology, in fact, causes adaptive belief. With respect to that neurology, uh, whatever, whatever belief content is related by the laws in question to that neurology, natural selection just has to take it. It can't modify that. That's the thought, right. Other questions or suggestions? Um, Mean, low, personal attacks. <laughs> yeah. In general, that's correct, but now is it correct in this case, though? Um, uh, so I have evidence that my cognitive faculties are reliable. Maybe I do some science. I go to the uh, MIT Cognitive Faculties Laboratory and have myself examined, have my cognitive faculties evaluated. They say, you're fine. Um, well, I don't see how I can really uh, take that as my evidence for thinking they are reliable because I have to suppose that they are reliable in order even to know that I went to, believe that I went to the MIT laboratory and, and believe that what they say is probably true and that what they said is, yeah, your faculties are reliable. So uh, I don't know if there's a, on this sheet, there's a nice quotation from Thomas Reed, which may not be here. Anyway, no, it's not. <clears throat> Thomas Reed says somewhere, if you're worried about whether somebody, one of your acquaintances, regularly lies to you, the right way to find out is not to ask them. <laughs> because the whole question was, you know, I mean, you've got the same question about what they say as you had to start with, and the same goes in, in your, with respect to your suggestion. Right. Right. More questions? If, um, if not, that's fine. I mean, if everybody's utterly convinced of what I've said. I won't, <laughs> won't object. That's, that's, yeah, Trent. So, uh, suppose someone says that you've shown that there's no conflict in content between theory of evolution and your Christianity, but they say there's some sort of, there's a, a methodological Accept things at face value, and isn't the conflict then a methodological one 
Well, that might be true if, in fact, um, if religious reasoning were, if people believe in God as a kind of scientific hypothesis, if they say, you know, if you ask me, why do I believe in God? From that point of view, the answer might be, well, I look around the world and it looks like there are all these different uh, uh, features of the world that make more sense from the point of view of theism <coughs> than from uh, the point of view of atheism. So I'm a theist. I'm a believer in God. But I don't think that's how it goes. People don't, it's not that belief in God is a kind of scientific hypothesis. It's not that uh, belief in God is in the same boat, so to speak, as various scientific hypotheses at all. And in fact, very much of what, of what we believe um, aren't really scientific hypotheses. You might make your same point about the past, for example. You know, why do I think there's a past? I don't really have any evidence for this, that in fact there's a past. Could be that everything, as Bertrand Russell said, uh, it could be that the whole world popped into existence five minutes ago, complete with all uh, crumbling mountains and wrinkled faces and other evidences of great age could certainly happen. How do I know that didn't happen? Well, I really don't know. I mean, I just take that up. I guess I, I think I do know, but I don't know. I can't give an argument. It just seems to me to be right. I don't, it's not on the basis of any sort of like scientific procedures that one forms such beliefs as that there's been a past or that there are other people or that there is an external world. Um, so, uh, so what you say would be a good objection if, or maybe would be a good objection, if in fact, um, if in fact religious belief were like a scientific hypothesis. But even if it were, you know, uh, you might have all kinds of other evidence for belief in God. It's not that everything would depend just on this particular case. You know, here you might say, well, I've got the fine-tuning argument. I've got the argument from uh, morality, and I've got all these other arguments, and then somebody comes along and says, yeah, but we know uh, that the scientific theory of evolution is true, and that's incompatible with belief in God. Well, then I've got an answer to that. What I, from that point of view, what I was doing now is giving an answer to that, to that objection, and that's worthwhile, even if, as a matter of fact, belief in God were like a scientific hypothesis, but I don't think it is. Is that really true? Well, maybe, but if I were to ask now, um, which would it be more irrational to do? Uh, refuse to believe in, say, quantum mechanics or general relativity on the one hand, and believe that there's been a past or that there are other people on the other hand. I would say the second would be way more irrational. Right. right. Yes. Did everybody hear the question? Uh, uh, the question is, um, well, suppose theism is true. How does that help with the probability of R, of our cognitive faculties, right? <coughs> suppose theism is true. Well, I mean, if, um, if theism is true, then among other things, human beings have been created in God's image. Part of God's image would be, maybe God's image is, contains various properties maybe uh, being able to have some kind of contact with God, to have some knowledge of God, but also just to have knowledge about our surroundings and what the world is like. God is a premier knower. We human beings are um, 
in being created in God's image resemble him and that we too can know not all the things he knows, but at least some things. That seems to make perfectly good sense. You don't get anything like a defeater from the idea that we've been created in God's image uh, together with we've come to be by way of evolution. That's the big difference. In the one case I say you get a defeater, in the other case you don't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know of anybody that does that. I mean, I haven't made an exhaustive search of the literature, but every time I've run across some evolutionist saying what random, oh, some person that works in this area is saying what randomness is, um, and I'm thinking in particular of people who uh, say this and are not believers in God, they always put it in these very same terms, sometimes much more briefly, sometimes more expansively, but that's just what, uh, what they say the term actually means. Now, if somebody said, uh, uh, well, we could have a different scientific theory here, one where random did mean include not being uh, orchestrated or directed or guided by God, uh, then I would think, first of all, it's, you'd wonder why, as a part of science, people would then go on to say these mutations are random. I mean, it would imply that there really wasn't any such person as God. Uh, that one doesn't ordinarily think of as part of science. But furthermore, the evidence that people propose for uh, the mutations being random in the relevant sense would no longer be evidence for randomness. I mean, then randomness would be vastly stronger and you'd no longer have the evidence for it that you have when it's, uh, when it's the uh, ordinary version. Right. Yes. Um, you're saying, um, suppose the naturalist just says, okay, I'm going to stop being a materialist. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's, I haven't really thought that through. I think that really deserves to be thought through, and I um, repent for not having so far done it but I don't know what the, what the answer is. I'm inclined, to think, I'm inclined to think you'll still have the same kind of argument, but it won't have the kind of uh, detail that it does when you include materialism. Yeah, the way it's stated, it, it does, right, yeah, right. Yes? So suppose you suppose you think that um, uh, suppose you think early Genesis has to, is supposed to be taken literally. You're you're a, a kind of literalist with res with respect to the first chapters of Genesis, and you think so. You think it's part of uh, your total religious belief, so to speak, that there was a flood that destroyed all uh, all of life except for uh, Noah and his and his family and presumably fish, I guess fish would have been all right. Uh, and now you come to think, no, that's not true. Some of you, th you think that gets uh, refuted by science that there was a flood. Well, I don't think that, it's not clear to me that that means you've now got a defeater for a belief in God. 
you've got a defeater for this for this particular thing that uh, there was a flood, but it's not the case that um, you can believe in God only if you think there was such a flood. Uh, um, it's conceivable that it might reduce your probability for God's existence a little bit, but it wouldn't have to even do that, I would say. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if that is. You might say, well, you know, we don't, we don't uh, try to give scientific arguments for there being other people. Uh, do we therefore have a tension between science and the idea that there are other people? Anti-solipsism, we might say. We don't give scientific arguments for there having been a past or an external world, but we don't think uh, that because we don't do that, uh, there's some kind of tension between science and the idea that there's been a past. Matter of fact, science really presupposes that there's been a past. So I don't, I don't see, uh, it's just that different parts of our noetic structure work in different ways. Um, it would be crazy to believe without scientific evidence that the total number of stars in our universe is even. That would be crazy to believe that without something like an argument of some kind. But it's not crazy to believe that there's been a past, even if you can't think of any, or if nobody knows a good uh, non-question-begging argument. These are just different beliefs, and they play a different role in our total noetic structure. And I'm saying maybe the same thing is true with respect to belief in God. So uh, you don't have any conflict just because, so far, I mean, you don't have a demonstration of a conflict just because you've shown that the one kind of belief is formed in a different way from another kind of belief. But. So we need to wrap up before the uh, reception, but uh, Dr. Funding, if we can end on you, this sort of note. Uh, if your arguments are successful, and certainly uh, David could reply to every challenge, what explains why so many people think there's a conflict? Can you take us out on sort of the explanation of, of, of given your, if, if you're right, then why that? Well, I think, um, I think uh, there are two reasons, and I think they both have to do in particular with maybe with evolution, right? On the one hand, as I was saying, lots and lots of experts in the field, uh, the ones I mentioned, you know, Ayala and uh, Dawkins and Dennett and, and a whole raft of people who are experts say that there's a conflict, and these are people who are experts, so it's not surprising that many of the rest of us believe they are experts. Then also, um, um, a lot of Christians, I don't know just what the proportions are, but there are lots of Christians who do want to take Genesis at face value or take it literally, take early Genesis literally. And so they think, um, well, what I'm being taught in the Bible, which is God's word, is that uh, the world came to be 6,000, 10,000 years ago, let's say. It involved Adam and Eve and so on. And and it just follows then that the whole evolutionary story isn't true, right? I think these, these would be two of the areas where there is uh, two of the reasons for there being conflict. It's worth noting that if you go back to the beginning of modern science, not only wasn't there no conflict, nearly all the uh, first scientists, Newton, Boyle, and so on, were serious believers in God, and they saw themselves in doing science just as exploring God's handiwork. They say, well, here's God, he made this wonderful world. How does this world work? Well, that's what we want to figure out as scientists. How does this thing God has made, how does it work? So they didn't see the slightest conflict. And it seems to me their attitude is perfectly viable now too. It's not that we've discovered that's an improper attitude or something like that. It seems to me that makes perfectly good sense. So it seems to me there shouldn't be the kind, that kind of conflict. Thank you, Dr.